So when looking at the Heinz model, we started running scenarios. We started doing drop boxes to look, to look at scenarios. I first want to link these scenarios into the model so we can see how these scenarios impact the return. But the first thing to note is the returns just don't seem very high. It's negative 0.4%. So when I first put this together, I was like, what's, you know, what's going on? What are the major things impacting these returns? How do you think about that? What are the major items? Why are the returns so low? This is big, you know, I've gotten this a lot of times in private equity interviews, right? They'll just show me a model with poor returns. I'll say, walk me through this. What's going on? So you have to understand the high level. What are the drivers? How do you think about it, right? It might not be build the model. It might be, what's going on with this? Just walk me through it. The exit multiple for like this sector is where you make it down. Point, point one. Yeah. So what does that mean? It would. But you mean it's at 20 right now in the market? Yeah. For ketchup? Not for ketchup, but for consumer. Yeah, for consumer products. At the time it wasn't though, and at the time it was predicted to go down. But yeah, exit multiple is one. And don't forget they're already paying a 20% premium. So you're betting on multiple expansion. Yeah. Okay, so that's one leg of it, so multiple expansion. Two, what else? Yeah, I'll be done. They have a lot of interest on their debt. Right, the interest could be weighing it down. What's their interest expense? So let's look at the financials. So the interest expense is, it actually hasn't jumped up so much since prior. What about the debt itself? Okay, so how does that impact the returns? Okay, and how does that impact the returns? Well, they had 70% in lieu of that, they're getting 70% of the returns, though. Yep. Okay, that could have partly to do with it. Yes. That could have part to do with it, right? If they were to, let's see, does this work? Uh, which device did I plug in? I plugged in speaker out, right? Um, keep that open in case something goes crazy. Um, so yeah, so their their assumptions is are that they're getting a piece of the equity. Let's see how that would change if Warren Buffett's preferreds import. 24%. That's what they want. Interesting structure. We'll look at how this compares to Warren Buffett's returns. What else is impacting their returns? Yeah. The leverage, which is basically kind of what you're saying. In some session, what about the leverage though in particular? Right, so they're kind of putting in, it depends on how you count the preferreds, but if you count the preferreds as debt, which is which is the case right now, so what Chloe was saying was, well, if you actually count that as equity, as common equity, then they would get a lot more of the, of the returns. If you count it as debt, then it's got to get paid before common, and they're getting less of the common. So that's a, a – so the whole capital structure is, is into play. The problem is – I wouldn't right now consider that a variable because that, that was the one thing that was fixed, right, in the proxy. Although you're right, these are generally variables. I want to get into how are they thinking about this deal? Why are the returns so low? So, one, maybe they do expect multiple expansion. You say multiples have climbed, right? And in, in some sense, they actually found an exit. What else? <clears throat> We're not assuming growth in operating. Why are we not assuming growth in operating? 
industry is uh, mature and it's catch up. So the industry is where check up catch up, which was the the rebuttal against multiple expansion. I don't know what what catch up's doing, but in the end, consumer products had increased a little bit. I guess. I don't know. I don't know what happened. I don't know where, where Kraft was because they ended up merging with Kraft, which wasn't their original strategy, by the way. But the outlook in the industry at the time was poor, right? They had negative, they had low growth, they late, low last 12 months growth, and even the market expected very low growth in the future, 0.4%. So remember that the three strategies to maximizing IRR are what? Multiple expansion, which you hit on. Two, what? Operating performance. What's the third one? Cash debt pay down. Right? So what what about those three pieces can we adjust to maximize IRR and make it real and consistent? So you're looking at the multiples, maybe increasing exit multiple. Um, what else? What else about the debt, the cash debt pay down? How is the cash right now? Maybe, but but what's what's the cash debt pay down? What is it right now? I'm trying to talk through drawing out a thesis. You know what I'm saying? And this is how you're supposed to do this for a case study. High level, narrowing down. What's the situation? What's the exit? What's the opportunity? Right? And we know the way leverage buyout mechanics are that there are three core strategies, right? We've, we've kind of been learning. One multiple expansion, two operating improvement, three cash pay down, Brendan. I was just saying, go to like, straight your balance sheet, how much cash you have. So if you go to the balance sheet, you got, well, well zero. Right. And here, here's the cash being produced, maybe. Uh, what's our ending debt? Their ending debt is, well, we haven't modeled any pay downs. That's partly why, but now if we do, there's not much being paid down. Yeah. It's like 1%, right? Or 10 or 10%. Um, and that's part of the problem. They do not have steady, consistent cash. Look, it was negative in this, I guess that was three quarters. So the idea of looking for a good buyout stemming from steady and consistent cash flows wasn't there. And you could say, all right, well, maybe they, maybe they can adjust some things here. Well, we already wiped out the capital structure. We're not paying down debt. What else is happening to increase that? We could maybe reduce CapEx a little bit, but that's not a, a large number. I mean, they got to pay down um, $15 billion in debt. This is not going to get them there. That was another concern. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so like decreased cost by Okay. Okay, so let's my, – my one thing on top of this, though, too, is we didn't model out Warren Buffett's returns, which we'll do after the great, after the break. He's expecting a 9% dividend a year, which is $720. So this cash doesn't even support that, right? So something has to happen to, to move this, right? First of all, you either want to believe in multiple expansion, which, which you could, and it came true, but that's, that's a risky proposition for somebody that's supposed to be kind of – a more value-driven investor than like Warren Buffett. Two, some way to maximize cash flow. Um, or three, some way to improve your EBITDA, right? So what's the way to improve your EBITDA? You can maybe run a scenario, management is expecting growth to jump 5.5%. But, but I don't know, do you, do you really think that these guys are going to invest, you know, or Warren Buffett's going to invest $8 billion in the business 8, 12, 12.1, 12.2 billion dollars in the business, and expect to grow catch up to 5.5 percent. That might be that might be aggressive. What were you gonna say, Brandon? Well, I didn't say it all. One other piece that you're getting to. Uh, I was just gonna add that. Yeah. You know, the interest expense um, seems pretty high relative to the. Um, Synergies that that, that you're creating. So yes. The uh, the cost of that is greater than the return on your equity in a way. Right. So that's gonna kind of yes. anything you Yes. Yes. So how would they? What do you think is the most rational? They have to. 
they can't be looking at the model this way, right? They have to be seeing some sort of positive return. They structured it that way, though, which is... They were, this, this debt's fixed. That's okay. Uh, so <clears throat> and we have low interest. We have 5% interest. I don't know how much more you can squeeze on that. Yeah. <laughs> You're right. You're thinking about the right thing, Chloe. More synergies, right? Possibly, right? You put in 5% synergies. Here goes a frozen model again. You put in 5% synergies, and how much does that improve the IRR, if at all? <clears throat> Five percent synergies brings the IR from negative to five percent, right? Ten percent synergies brings it probably to ten percent, right? Which is a benefit, a more risk-averse benefit. Usually, when you model out leveraged buyouts, at least what, what what private equity funds do is they model out a scenario where even if the growth is zero, you still want to see an eight to ten percent return, just as much as you'd as you'd get for lending. Right, lending debt into the business, and so you would hope to grow the business. But if you don't, and if you grow the business, you'd reap positive benefits of 25% return. But even if there's zero growth, you're going to get at least a 10% return. It's it's a it's a it's a win-win situation. And 10% return isn't ideal when you're when you're shooting for 25% returns, but it's at least risk averse. And this has got to be the way that they're looking at it. But to expect multiple expansion in a market that was already a little bit saturated. They had an exit though, um, was aggressive. The, historically, it was 0.4% growth. Maybe they can do things to grow the business. Maybe they can do things to grow the business internationally. You know, I looked at the revenue model up and down, but it was declining. Walmart just announced that their international business was declining, and whatever Walmart says usually sets the trend for this type of industry. Go ahead. Is that? You know, we are modeling this on a pretty short time period for the yep. big investor Warren Buffett is, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, Warren Buffett could buy this business for, honestly, forever, right? So yeah. If you make 7, 8, 9% a year forever, that's really good. Yes. Right? So, $720 million a year. Yeah. Also, on top of his dividend, with a guaranteed $8 billion back and then potential upside, which is in this scenario, this is the return to 3G. Yeah, the 3G. The return to Warren Buffett's, we, we got to look at that in a second. But this is given cost. Something needs to get from negative 0.4% to his safety zone for him to agree on this, right? And of all the variables, multiple expansion, cash debt pay down, EBITDA growth, if you look at the three areas, multiple expansion is risky. Cash debt pay down is not there. It's not there. Plus, he needs an extra $720 million. It's got to be through EBITDA growth, and that's either through growing revenue or cost cutting. Right. So, yeah, David. Say it again, please. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Well, you know, you're right in the sense that if you're if you're if you're improving operation performance, that's going to also in effect improve your cash and improve the debt pay down and improve everything. It would when you think about the three strategies independently, it would be nice. It would be ideal if the company was already producing high enough cash to pay down debt independently of any additional operation improvements. And any additional operation improvements would increase that further. I don't know if that's where you were going. But it, it is kind of hand in hand. Is that kind of where you were going? Maybe not by your silence. <laughs> where are you thinking it through? But I mean... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, whether you do that with you know, that, mm. or whether you put it in the best action business, either way, it's just direct by value expanded. Yes. So ultimately, when you sell your business, you will get that value back. 
Yes. Did you have to pay down debt? No. I see what you're saying. Yeah, well, it depends. It depends on the – you have to do a return analysis, right? What's, what's the benefit of reducing 5% of interest versus the return on any assets that you might generate from, from building using that cash flow? So you'd have to run that analysis. But arguably, maybe you're right. Maybe it shouldn't be, although it is just because of convention, it shouldn't be – Cash generated to debt pay down should be just cash generated to some sort of growth, either paying down debt or either building up an asset base, which would further grow the business. And it also depends on your strategy. I think I think usually paying down debt is the quickest path to a higher return. But if you have like a Warren Buffett type investment where he's more has a long term strategy, maybe you're right, maybe building more assets would lead to maybe maybe not in the short term, but in the long run you know, um, more benefits because you're growing EBITDA further, et cetera, et cetera. And maybe there's a way to kind of mitigate between the two. So I see your point. Yeah, it could be. Um, <clears throat> and the curiosity was he said that he had long-term prospects in this, but this is a leveraged buyout, right? A leveraged buyout traditionally is, is not long-term, right? It's, it's definitely not a long-term, even though he said it was. And this got into the debate of, well, is this a leveraged buyout or not? And there's a few problems with this. And he said, no, it's not a leveraged buyout because his, his prospects were longer term for the business, right? And the problem with that is, well, 3G is not a long-term type of investor, right? They had just done a major buyout with Burger King, turned over the CEO, done major cost cutting. That's their strategy. They are a straight private equity Player. And that was the problem. A lot of people were concerned about cost cutting, about jobs. And then Warren Buffett was like, no, no, this is my first time doing such a large type of leverage buyout. I'm not that type of investor. I am not going out and and doing – we're not going to do major cost cutting. Uh, Heinz is going to stay in Philadelphia. You know, I'm the type of, the type of investor that, that, you know, really cares about the product, things like that. And um, when you look at the modeling, I, I don't see how – he can get even to his comfort zone of returns without cost cutting to some degree of security, right? I mean, do you see that? I mean, there's multiple expansion could happen, but there's risk associated with that. Revenue growth could happen, but there's risk associated with that, right? You typically invest in businesses that have had continued growth, so there's no risk in that. You know it's going to continue. High and steady cash flows. So there's no risk in that. You know that that's going to continue. The risk might be maybe the business is going to decline. That's less of a risk than trying to run it, run additional costly initiatives to jump growth from 0.4% to 5.5%. So any way you look at it, the quickest way to get to 10% is by slip, cutting costs. You know, a business that's been operating since the mid-1800s must have been built with a lot of inefficiencies over the past 100 years, Right? What do you think? I just, you know, I don't think to, um, for, for an investor like Warren Buffett, he really cares about getting the return that's like private equity. Like, I mean, you have to think about, you know, this guy is investing lots and lots of money, right? And so you kind of admit it that. It's hard to make those types of returns like, when you have this much asset money management. Right. So his ability to buy a business like Heinz that has a very good brand name that's not going to go anywhere anytime soon is a good value proposition even though he's making a low return over the next five, uh, ten, maybe even 20 years. Consider this low with cost cutting though. Right. So that the cost cutting is that's negative. Very low. Yes, exactly. So it's hard to allocate that, that kind of capital mm -hmm. if you're managing that much money. Mm -hmm. So it just... You know, it's kind of like, uh, you know, like you, you bought with the uh, railroad business. Mm -hmm. The railroad is not going to grow, right? Right. But uh, it's a good investment over the next 100 years. Yeah. Uh, because people are going to still need it over that time period. So, Burlington Northern did grow, though. He bought that kind of just as the tail. Yeah, I think he hit the right timing on that. And it was a little like undervalued. It's not, he's not getting 25% returns from these investments. Yeah. But he's getting something. And remember, at the 0.4% growth rate it was without cost cutting, he wasn't even generating enough cash to get his $720 million a year. That was stipulated in the um, preferred equity contracts. Something has to move to get from negative 0.4.
What do you think it is? He said no. He said everything's going to be the same. It's a great business. You look at the numbers. Something had to move. They had the revolver. They could dip into that revolver. There's that. They could. Could be. It's interesting. Anyone else? For an uh, for first of all, there's got to be an exit because three G's got to get out of this. If Warren Buffett could be long term, right? Three G has to find an exit. It's got to be one of the three pillars. It's got to be EBITDA growth, cash debt paydown, or multiple expansion. It's got to be one of those. Yeah, no. Uh, just if the company is generating high cash, that'll slowly pay down debt or go to some sort of asset growth. To David's point, um, yeah. No, if you pay down, the return goes up. You're converting debt into equity. Incremental impact on interest savings, not nothing major. Well, it was a mystery. I don't want to dwell on it more. It was a mystery, right? It was a mystery. How are they going to grow this business? And Warren Buffett did say that he was going to focus on revenue growth. He wasn't going to focus on cost cutting. It was a major concern. Uh, he wasn't going to focus on – he was hoping for EBITDA multiple expansion. And I put in the book that I thought it was going to be cost cutting. So you could argue – we could argue back and forth. But a month after the deal closed and after the book came out, this is what came out. <laughs> the cover of the Wall Street Journal. And there was subsequent reports of this. So they did major cost cutting. And it was funny because I had sworn that um, he had said, and maybe I exaggerated a bit, in the press conference when they announced the transaction that people had asked about cost cutting, and he said, no, there's not going to be cost cutting. So this happens – this came out when I was teaching with you guys, and I went back to the press conference on their website where I thought he said that, and they took it down. <laughs> but then I found it on YouTube. So let's go to the videotape. I don't know, and I listened again, and, and let's see. You, you can be the judge. Oh, does it, do we have audio? Oh, that's too bad. But it is interesting. It's, it's kind of it's, – I think it's interesting. I don't think we're going to get it. If, if we don't get it, we'll have to do it. Uh, when we're downstairs tomorrow. Oh, I hear something, right? Is that me? Is that coming from that? Yes. This little thing opened. Yeah, yeah, this thing. Say it again? Uh, yeah, I think I... I wonder if this is your price. It also represents almost 14 times EBITDA and over a 30% premium to our 10-year EBITDA average. We won't watch the whole thing. Given this value and following a comprehensive review, our board has unanimously approved this transaction. So he's excited. He's a CEO. The deal will deliver a substantial return for shareholders and ensure our commitment to Pittsburgh. Okay, so you're happy about Pittsburgh. Appetite for premium quality, great tasting, convenient foods that deliver value. He's proud of his ketchup. Step questions from the press in the room. Questions. Thank you, and with that, I'll turn it over to yeah. Alex. That's a 3G guy. Thank you, Bue, and, and thanks again for inviting me to be here today. Uh, and good morning. Uh, I was very excited uh, coming into Pittsburgh today. and, and He's excited. I, I, I think I'll that the reasons that led us to start the conversations with Heinz that led to this transaction are simple and will come as no surprise to anyone. I mean, first, we're very excited about the brand. It, it's a, you know, as Bill just said, it's a truly global brand. It's, it's, it has incredible consumer perception around the world, uh, and it, it's really a, 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 really a powerhouse brand. 
Number two, the position the company is in, the enviable position that that, that, that Heinz is in, in the food industry on, on a global basis, being you know generally number one or number two in a variety of categories. They're attractive, growing, and and that position obviously, as it, 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 which brings me to the third reason. <laughs> That, that, that we were excited to, to they were so excited to do this is the people because I mean the company did not get to this position you know wouldn't would not have gotten to this position without the great work that was done in this company he sounds like he's, he's in the last coached. 15 years under your leadership, the media you know, where where this company Positive really for the people, for the people. Uh, 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 was very very successful I mean, I'm, I'm not even going to mention the numbers himself. that he just did that which he's speak for themselves but, but, but it was really really remarkable a remarkable run that put the company in this position. Okay, it, let's get to questions. Searching for excellence. Excellence. Immediately call me and say no. It's they're proud. And I think here it's it's very early to say. I think we you know we just. Uh, oh, here we go. She has been associated with some, uh, aggressive. Here we go. Here we go. Poignant question. Drew Singer from Thomson Reuters. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, 3G has been associated with some uh, aggressive cost-cutting measures in the past. Is that a strategy we're likely to see here? And, and if so, in what areas have you identified? You know, I, I think that we've been, you know, in, involved in a variety of deals in the past. Some of them had a, a, a lot of cost optimization and opportunities and efficiency, and some of them did. And I think here. It's it's very early to say. I think we you know we're just uh, getting involved and have several months ahead of us to get to understand the team and the people. And this certainly is a company that, if you were to compare and contrast with some of the businesses that we got you know involved with in the past, this is a company that's doing extremely well as it is and has been doing extremely well for a number of years prior to our involvement. That's cop out answer to me. Uh, Keith James from KDK Radio, uh, Mr. Johnson. When did this deal start, and who sought home? You would know. It exactly. started actually almost eight weeks ago. Knowing the this due diligence week process, when, uh, you'd know Alex where you're cutting. And George Lemon, one of his partners, visited. And two weeks me. later, they fired him. Uh, we had dinner. Actually, I thought he must they were have known that. Though. Dinner we got a big exit Burger King, and they were a customer, and they were unhappy. Turns out they were a happy customer, and that led to further conversation. They, they brought it up again. Time, which you'll see, is hopefully a growing. Somebody brought it up again. High. We've had 30 consecutive quarters of organic top line growth. I mean, this company's never won't change. And I think beyond that, I said to them, number two, what changes, if any, are ahead for benefits, for pensions, for relationships, even more global company? And I think that's a goal we share uh, with 3G and with Mr. Buffett. Bob Mayo from WTAE TV here in Pittsburgh. You had meetings with some employees locally here earlier today. What is being conveyed to employees? What can you tell them right now, the families of employees that are listening, number one? And number two, what changes, if any, are ahead for benefits, for pensions, for working relationships with employees here? Well, I met with employees. Mr. Baring was not uh, in the meeting with employees. I met with employees this morning and what turned out for me to be a very emotional meeting. If you'll talk to my employees, I think I spent about half the time in tears and the other half uh, telling jokes. And it's a very emotional day. Having said that, I also told the employees that over, certainly over the next four or five months before uh, this initiative closes, there'll be no changes, that they will continue to be expected to perform their jobs as usual, that business continue to run the way it's been run, that leadership won't Which change. Obviously major, and I think at least beyond that, jobs. I said to them, the more value we create as employees, the more opportunities we identify, you know, I think the safer people will be. And I also said to them, but there are certain things I couldn't comment on because I don't know the answer to it. And that's one of them. I don't know long term uh, what the employment situation will be. We have 1,200 people in Pittsburgh between our North American operations and our world headquarters operation. And I think given the fact that we're remaining in Pittsburgh, we have a desire to grow. I think there can be some assurances that a number of people are going to remain committed to this company and employed by this company. But I think beyond that, it's too early to comment because we just don't know. Okay. Well, I guess I didn't realize he said that at the end, so he kind of let it way out. But I didn't realize they had 1,200. So this was half their workforce. Right. 
the 1200 maybe there's just 1200 in the headquarters but you would you would know you would know if that's going to happen in the next three or four months the, the way due diligence runs and the way the due diligence process is and if they didn't realize they're going to extract that much synergies it would have been too risky it would have been too risky the way we know the model so the, the point is i thought that was interesting the point is i think that the the numbers in these models Although they're not the be-all, end-all, they, they do have a place in these transactions in terms of understanding where the value is, right? Um, in the end, I think you might have heard a few months ago, actually just, it just closed in July, they ended up merging with Kraft, and they're not public again, so they went private. And then a few months later, they ended up merging with Kraft. That was interesting. That was not part of the plan. If, if they were going to spin this off to Kraft and make it probably one of the largest, it was a fifth billion dollar 50 billion dollar merger they would have touted that as a huge positive that's a huge exit strategy so the whole idea of Warren being Buffett being a long-term investor into the garbage with that right um, so they turned it around they streamlined it they cut like half their workforce and then they sold it to another business and he made a lot of money but that combined entity isn't doing well so an earnings report came out actually this morning where their earnings are down which is interesting but all all it was it's an interesting case I think. Um, so it's important to see a little bit more what his intentions are. Let's look at model, modeling out his returns, modeling out the returns um, to him based on the preferred security securities, and we'll look at that further. So let's let's take a break. Okay. So that's what he put in, right? Four one two, eight billion. <clears throat> and what did he take out? So he took out, I don't know why I separated this in two lines. I guess it wasn't necessary, but he took out 30% of common. So it's the common times 30%. That's what he got out. He got his preferred equity back. I can just negate this if you want. Right? And he got his... Dividends. So what I'm assuming here is because the company didn't have enough cash to pay those dividends down, he's just going to defer them and take them out in one lump sum. So I don't know. My, there's, honestly, there's really no point in deferring them. You want it like debt. You want the yearly interest. So the other way to do it is you take it in yearly, but then it dips into the revolver. So we'll we'll model that out. We'll try to start to model that out. But that, that was the point. I want to know, is he what's going to happen in the situation that he doesn't achieve growth and he doesn't achieve was cost cutting like you suggested. It's that's that might be why they had a one point five billion dollar revolver as a cushion. What would happen? What would be the impacts on the return? So let's build in a switch that says what would happen if he defers his payments or if he doesn't defer his payments. But for now let's just simply model out assuming that he has deferred it. And so his returns is a sum of everything. This is what he gets. He gets thirteen billion dollars. And I'm going to put zeros here, and this is what he's put in, right? So we can calculate the returns. It's not not too significant here, is it? And the return multiple is money out divided by money in, so 2.5 percent return. Not a lot. Save this. Does anybody have questions on that, how that works? <clears throat> this is even the what's, – what's the, what's the low growth case? And actually, we should run the cases too. The low growth case – right? is this high growth here? Oh, no, this is the, oh, this is the high cost cutting. The low cost cutting case. One point one percent. There's his downside protection, right? He's not getting negative return. 
but 3G has a lot to lose. There's more to look at there. Yeah. One thing we haven't done is link in the scenarios in through the model. So if you go through financials, this 0.4% should link into the current year-over-year -year revenue growth. So we should be linking that in. Same thing with the COGS. All the drivers. SG&A is a percentage of revenue. Cost savings is a percentage of SG&A. And I think we did taxes, right? Varying taxes. So if we run the base case, or this is the most conservative case, the returns are pretty bad. Negative 5.2. This was even lower. This wasn't 0.4% growth. This is 0% growth. This wasn't 27% tax rate. This was the corporate 35% tax rate. Added a little bit more weight. He's avoiding a negative return. Now, we didn't run the management case where the management assumed that they would receive 5.5% growth, and I assume 15% SG&A. Now we're looking pretty good. 31% to 3G. 6% to Warren Buffett isn't a tremendous amount, but he's getting $720 million a year and an additional $4 billion. That's probably the way he's looking at it. It's a lot of money. For doing, remember, he's doing nothing. He's just a financier in this case, right? So, yeah. So, right. At this point, we can. So let's model that out. So how do we model in preferred dividends? We have time. We have time to start looking at it. So we need to think, well, in this case, maybe we can switch to preferred dividends. How would you model out preferred dividends? Yeah, so one thing I would do is I'm going to I'm going to make them a payout. We're, we're paying out equity here. We're paying out equity here. I'm going to say dividends the preferred dividends. And I'm going to model in and I'm going to have a percentage under here, just so we have it. They're paying 9% on his $8 billion. I'm going to say preferred dividends. Right? Which is 9%. times the equity put in. So I'm going to hard code 9%. Up to the right. Make it blue. What up? It's weird. And so the actual payout is going to be nine percent times the assumptions of eight billion, and I'm going to anchor that so I can copy to the right. That's just one place. I could have put it in my assumptions tab. I just put it here because this is where dividends go, and I, and I could, if I want to, although it's not going to go anywhere. Check what the net income is after those payouts. So what happens? This this gets pulled out. Since the net income we're driving into the cash flow statement is before dividends, this 720 gets pulled out in our cash flow statement. I'm just going to use the dividends line here. I'll say dividends, including preferred dividends now. 
could have created a new line, but this line isn't being used, and I'll pull it in. As a negative. Money out. I don't know why this is doing this. Every cell. So what happens? 720 comes out, and they have a shortage here. Right? What should be happening? The revolver should be kicking in. So I think we turned it off. Right? We should not be insolvent here. So we should have a revolver kick in. One. And I've I've used condi you guys don't know how to use conditional formatting format if it's negative so I just said if this is positive means they're kick the revolvers kicking in which means they're kind of in the danger zone I went conditional formatting highlight cell rules if greater than zero if it's positive then fill light with dark red as it's a default. I could change that if I wanted to, what color I want it to be. So highlight if it's greater than zero. Very simple. So it should balance already because dividends automatically, we've modeled it to link in to the accumulated other comprehensive loss. It's the dividends. It already there's a whole bunch of things going in there. It's the dividends. The dividend line was already there. So it's going to impact cash goes down, retain earnings goes down, like all dividends. And so what happens is if there's preferred dividends, then this becomes zero. This becomes zero. And we will start to wire in the negative 720 here. Let's see what impact it makes. But I want to do it with a switch, and let's do that tomorrow. I want to go through the dividends with a switch. I want to go through capitalizing, amortizing debt fees, modeling out paid and kind securities, these little advanced things. And then don't forget there's the test on Monday. Okay. I'll email this around.